All right. Hey, everyone. Uh, I'm Stefan from Varian, and we're an early stage genomics company. I want to thank Matt from Maze for doing a great introduction about uh, human genetic diversity and how that's transforming drug development. So I won't need to uh, convince you of that here, at least. Uh, so our talk is going to be a little bit different than some of the other talks today, and I think you'll get a feel for what makes us kind of a unique company. And I'm going to start by telling you about a trek that we just got back from actually a few weeks ago uh, in the Kumbu region of Nepal, which if anyone's been there, uh, it's the area you have to go through to get to, uh, get to Mount Everest. So uh, before I do that, so I'll just introduce myself. So I'm Stefan, I'm the CTO of Varian, and I'm a computational geneticist by training. And beside me here, uh, who also went to Nepal with me, is Kaya Wasik, who's our CSO, and she's a molecular biologist. And uh, we were in Nepal because of a very special people who are the Sherpa, and they have some really unique health characteristics. So take, for example, Mingma Sherpa here. Uh, he's actually summited Everest three times as a guide, uh, as well as three other mountains over 8,000 meters, which is really incredible. Uh, and when he summits, he climbs three times the distance versus the lowlanders that he's guiding. And that's because he has to do things like carry equipment uh, up the mountain, also carry oxygen, set up camp, even start boiling water, and then going back down uh, and collecting the other people that he's helping to guide up. And despite going three times the distance, he actually uses just half as much the oxygen. And that's because he doesn't have to start using oxygen until a much higher altitude uh, as compared to the lowlanders that he's working with. And this was really incredible to me, but he doesn't do any physical training to prepare himself to climb Everest, which is just insane. Uh, and we asked him if he ever suffers any ill effects from being at high altitude, and he told us that he sometimes gets a headache, but that's about it. And as we were interviewing him, we were all ourselves dying from altitude sickness, and that was, you know, very, very low compared to what he's doing on Everest. So this seemed really incredible to us, uh, but maybe it's not that surprising because the Sherpas spend their whole lives at high altitude, and they've really done so for hundreds, if not thousands of years. And Westerners, of course, if you know, if you've gone up there, you can adapt to this high altitude, but it ends up hurting you in the long run due to things like stroke and heart disease. Uh, it's really incredible to see the Sherpa work at high altitude. So here's a Sherpa porter uh, carrying stuff up and down the mountain without being winded at all. Uh, donkeys and porters are the only way to get things up there, and helicopters, but those are a little bit more expensive. So how is this possible? Well, some preliminary genetic studies have shown that the Sherpa have unique changes in their DNA that allows them to be healthy at high altitude. So these genetic changes make them resistant to hypoxia through modified muscle metabolism and augmented blood flow, particularly to the brain. And they do this uh, despite having lowered red blood cell count, which actually helps compensate for some of the problems, uh, cardiovascular problems that you see at high altitude. And building on this knowledge, Varian is carrying out the first ever population scale genetic study to understand how genetic adaptation to high altitude affects Sherpa physiology more broadly. So it consists of participants who are going to have their genome sequenced alongside extensive cardiovascular, metabolic, and pulmonary measurements. So you might be asking yourself, why is this company sequencing a bunch of Sherpa in Nepal? Well, <laughs> Uh, imagine if we could use the Sherpa's natural resistance to low oxygen conditions to help treat people with disease. So we think that, for example, the next treatment for lung disease might be uncovered by variant and inspired by the Sherpa's genomes. Uh, and this isn't a pipe dream. As you heard in the talk before, genomics is already transforming drug discovery, uh, and there are drugs coming on market now that were entirely inspired by genetic studies. So this, in a nutshell, is what we're doing at Variant. Uh, we're bringing together this previously fragmented process of genomics-based drug discovery under one roof. Uh, we're searching for people in populations that have these very unique health characteristics really around the world. Uh, we're doing genetic studies on them using the latest advances in DNA sequencing technology, uh, analyzing genomes using uh, what's now standard statistical genetics, and ultimately uh, hoping to find new ways to treat disease. And we think this is a really powerful approach because essentially we can leverage what nature has created to help find entirely new therapeutic targets and new ways to treat disease. So this is an approach that uh, relies entirely on people, obviously. Uh, and unlike Varian, a lot of big pharma and other companies are focused on mining data from homogenous European ancestry populations. I think you saw a lot of that with the different cohorts that companies like Maze are accessing. And I think there's a lot to be gained from mining those data sets, but I also think there's still so much genetic diversity out there, and, and we believe that too. So Europeans represent just 6% of the global population and a tiny sliver of global genetic diversity. 
And it should be obvious that we shouldn't stop there, and there's really so much that we're missing by just focusing on those cohorts we've already collected. So at Varian, we think that the most informative people to study are those that are living in places that traditionally science has neglected. People living in remote villages or low-income countries or even in environmental extremes like in Nepal. So at Varian, we're focusing on the other 94% of the globe. And I'm really uh, excited and proud to say that we already have studies underway in 15 countries across all the continents except Antarctica. Uh, we've been, been doing a lot of traveling over the past year. Uh, and I just think this is awesome for a company that's just a year old. And hopefully we'll have some really exciting science to share with you in the future. Uh, but finding these extraordinary people is just a small part of what we're doing at Variant. And I thought because of kind of the theme today, it'd be nice to talk about how technology has really powered everything we're doing at the company. And first and foremost of those technologies is DNA sequencing. Um, I don't need to tell people in this room that costs have dropped dramatically to sequence a genome in the past 20 years uh, by really orders of magnitude, but I think that they're still just too expensive to do at population scale, and especially for a small biotech startup like ourselves. So we're trying to do genetic studies on a fairly limited budget, and I thought it might be nice to share some of our experience with the audience here in case other people have uh, similar problems that they're facing. So if you're doing genetic studies on a budget, there's a few options that you have. And we decided to rank these options based on, of course, their cost, how much of the genome they can cover, and if they have the ability to detect novel genetic variation. So coming in at the cheapest, uh, the cheapest step is our genotyping arrays, obviously very affordable, but they cover just a tiny fraction of the genome and are totally useless to identify novel genetic variants by design. So that just was not going to work with us when we're, that's the whole point of our company is to find new genetic variants. Uh, next, you have whole exome sequencing, uh, which is more expensive. It covers just the small fraction of the genome that is protein coding, and it can detect novel genetic variation there. Um, we decided not to go with this because we just know so much more about genome biology now that says that non-coding variation uh, is just as important as coding variation. And I should put a disclaimer there. I was actually one of the lead analysts for the GTEx project that Maze is using uh, for their work, so I'm very biased to think that the non-coding genome is important. Uh, and that brings us back to whole genome sequencing, which of course checks all the boxes but is extremely expensive. So what we decided to go with is something called low-pass whole genome sequencing. And what that does is instead of sequencing to 30x uh, coverage, which is the gold standard, you sequence to something like uh, 1x or 4x. This allows you to save costs but have a lot of the same benefits that you would have from an uh, unbiased approach like whole genome sequencing. So we've had to do some optimization to get low-pass working for us. Um, first, low-pass uses a method called imputation, which essentially lets you fill in the gaps of genotype calls due to um, non-uniform coverage across the genome and just low coverage in general. And imputation is done using reference panels that are predominantly European individuals. And you can imagine for a company like us, our samples are, none of them are European, so reference panels don't work as well for us to do imputation. So what we had to do is modify our study design, and I hope this is helpful for some people here, but what you can do is to sequence a subset of the cohort using high-pass whole genome sequencing to 30x, uh, and then you can use that to create a population-specific reference panel for your study, and then use that for imputation with the rest of your cohort done at low-pass. And we found that that works really, really well for us. Uh, we've also done some optimizations to our bioinformatics pipeline. So we do joint variant calling, which works well even for low-pass data with GATK best practices. And we also do really, really strict filtering of those low-pass genotype calls before putting them in, into imputation, which we've also found makes a big difference. Uh, and finally, we've also implemented a strategy where after we've done the imputation, we can actually use the low-pass reads to go back and correct uh, errors in genotype calls from imputation. So incorporating all of these strategies together, we're able to get what I think are some pretty amazing costs on a budget, or some pretty amazing results on a, on a low cost budget. So as compared to gold standard 30X whole genome sequencing, for 1X we can boost recall up to 74% while maintaining precision at 82% for just 10% of the cost. And if you go a little bit higher with 4X, we can get all the way up to 96% recall uh, while maintaining precision at 94% for just 20% of the cost. And I think this makes low pass a total no brainer for us. And if anyone else is thinking of doing genetic studies in the audience here, I would suggest using it. Uh, we had to do a lot of heavy lifting to get it set up for us because we're kind of a, an edge case using low pass. Um, but I want to point out and call out a great biotech startup in New York called GenCove, 
who essentially has out of the box solutions to be able to do low pass studies. And Tomas is in the audience here today, so you should definitely chat with him if you're interested. So uh, I also wanted to talk about how cloud computing powers uh, everything we're doing at Variant. And especially since this is AWS reInvent, I thought I could spend just a little bit time talking about how we use AWS infrastructure effectively. So we use it really for everything, for a company-wide database, our bioinformatics pipelines, for statistical genetics, and other analytics. And powering all of our studies at the center of everything we're doing is a scalable, uh, scalable database that we really built from the ground up for the genomics era. So we have a really beautiful web-based front end, which you can see a little snapshot of here, uh, with rich data visualization. And most importantly, by managing everything from uh, phenotypic data and sequencing data to consent form and cohort designs, uh, it allows for our bioinformatics and statistical genetics platforms to be fully automated. We didn't want anyone submitting any jobs manually at any point. So uh, here's just a brief overview of the architecture for our database application. Uh, standard stuff, the front end is built in React, and we're using uh, Redux for state management and Webpack for application bu uh, bundling. Uh, the back end leverages the AWS serverless architecture, so API Gateway and Lambda. We found that to be very cost effective and just generally efficient. For storage, we use RDS with Aurora for relational data and S3 for file and object storage. And this goes without saying, but you can save a lot of money, especially if in, you're in genomics and we just deal with huge amounts of data uh, by intelligently using Glacier and, and file tiering there. Uh, so we do our deployment through Circle CI with the front end uh, in a Docker container that gets deployed on EC2 using Elastic Beanstalk and the back end going right into the serverless framework. Uh, and CloudFormation is used to do all of this under the hood. So for our bioinformatics tech, tech stack, uh, we have Jupyter notebooks that pull all their inputs, inputs to run the jobs from the database. And they run the jobs on AWS Batch using a combination of on-demand and spot instances. Uh, which again, you can save a lot of money using uh, the spot instances, and they're run from Docker containers and ECR. And our pipelines are written in Nextflow, which I saw called out on one of Elliot's slides, which is great. And we found that Nextflow makes it really easy to create complex workflows uh, combined across, combined scripts across different programming languages, is really flexible across the infrastructure that you want to use, uh, and just generally makes things really reproducible, and uh, the syntax is very well organized, so it's nice to work with. And then we have our Nextflow pipelines that are writing back to our database application. So all the files, results, QC, analyses go back into the database. And finally, I just wanted to end by telling you a little bit about what drives the people who work at our company. So we're building something that's obviously starting from people, um, but we also wanted to be giving back to people. So we are giving back to the communities that made our discoveries possible through a benefit sharing program. Uh, we don't want to become another evil pharma company and no one wants to work with you or give you genetic data if you're going to do that. Uh, so a portion of our revenue is going back into community projects that support capacity building, education, healthcare, and sustainable development. All right, so that's what I wanted to share with you today. I hope it was interesting or helpful for some other folks doing genomics in the audience. Uh, we have a really incredible team that made all of this possible, and I'm happy to have been able to speak with you on their behalf. Thanks.